So fairly recently, a physicist named Brian Green posted this photo on his Facebook page. This is a photo of the Schwarzschild metric, and he posted this on the day that the very first picture of a black hole that humanity has ever taken was announced for the first time. Now, on Brian's Facebook page, there were lots of comments along the lines of, this equation looks beautiful, but I wish I could understand what it said. And this is where I come into the picture. In this video, I'm going to be explaining exactly what this equation means, or at least roughly what this equation means. Although, don't worry, you don't need to be a graduate mathematician or anything like that. You just need to know a little bit of high school maths. And certainly the basics are pretty understandable. So stick around and let's see what we can do. So let's start with something that we might think has absolutely nothing to do with this equation. Let's start with Pythagoras' theorem. Now, Pythagoras' theorem is a really useful theorem that we can use to work out the length of the longest side of a right angle triangle when given the length of the two shorter sides. Or the other way around, of course. As long as we're given two lengths of the sides of a right angle triangle, we can work out what the length of the third side is. Now, this can become especially useful when we're trying to find the distance between two random points on a coordinate grid. We know that to get from one point to the other, we need to move four units in the x direction and three units in the y direction. Therefore, at this point, we've created a right angle triangle where the distance that we're trying to find is the longest side of the triangle, otherwise known as the hypotenuse. So using Pythagoras' theorem, we can see that the distance that we're trying to find, that's the length of the longest side of the triangle, is five units. So Pythagoras' theorem is really useful when trying to find the distance between two random points on a coordinate grid. What about two points in 3D space? Well, let's start by using a three-dimensional grid to represent the space that the points are in. So each point has an x-coordinate, y-coordinate, and z-coordinate. That's the three dimensions of space. And then we might think about using Pythagoras' theorem to work out the distance between these two points as well. We can say that dx, the distance moved in the x-direction, squared, plus dy, the distance moved in the y-direction, squared, is equal to the distance that we're trying to work out, squared. However, using this equation doesn't work for us because we haven't accounted for the difference in z-direction. In fact, I'll leave this as an exercise to you. Try and work out how we get to this equation here. This equation gives us the distance between these two points in a three-dimensional coordinate grid. It's almost like a modified Pythagoras' theorem where this time we account for the third dimension as well. We account for the difference in z-coordinates. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that by going from a two-dimensional grid to a three-dimensional grid, we had to account for that extra dimension and modify our distance equation. Well, guess what? Special relativity tells us that there are four dimensions, not just three. The three spatial dimensions, and then there's the time dimension as well. And of course, this is in relation to the universe that we're living in. We live in a space-time sort of blended together. In other words, then, if we want to accurately find the distance, or let's not call it distance anymore, let's call it interval between two points in four-dimensional space, then we have to account for the fourth dimension as well. Exactly how we had to account for the third dimension when we went from a 2D grid to a 3D grid. By the way, as a quick aside, the reason I said we should call it the interval between two points rather than the distance is because distance implies spatial distance, right? Whereas in this case, we're considering the interval that includes time now. Now, interestingly, when we modify the formula and account for the time coordinate, the time coordinate has the opposite sign to the three spatial coordinates. It doesn't really matter whether we choose negative for the time and positive for the space, or positive for the time and negative for the space. Mathematicians use one convention and physicists use the other. It doesn't matter which we pick as long as we're consistent with it and follow it through entirely. And another modification we want to make when we're discussing space-time is that we're not finding the interval between two points in space-time anymore. We're finding the interval between two events in space-time. This is just technical stuff, not really important, but that's what we're going to call it nonetheless. Oh, and by the way, I made a video about Albert Einstein and how he came up with his ideas for special relativity a little while ago, go check it out up here if you haven't seen it already. Anyway, so I'm not going to go into much detail about the consequences of the fact that we have this weird negative time bit when we're now trying to measure the interval between two events in space-time, but the idea is that just like we had to account for the third dimension when we went from 2D to 3D, we have to account for the fourth dimension when going from 3D to 4D. We won't go into too much detail here, we haven't even got to the black hole equation yet, but bear with me, we're getting there. What's important right now is that we've developed a framework for calculating the interval between two events in four-dimensional space-time. However, the issue with this is that the interval that we've calculated assumes that space-time is flat. In other words, space-time itself is not warped by anything. So what do I even mean by this? Well, this is something that's really difficult to imagine in four dimensions, partly because we struggle to imagine four dimensions. So let's go back to the 3D case then and imagine that we're trying to measure the distance once again between two points on a 3D grid. But this time let's add a limitation. Let's say that the two points are limited to being on the surface of a sphere, and for that matter so are we doing the measuring. In this situation, if we're stuck on the surface of the sphere, that is, we can't fly up into the air above the sphere or dig into the sphere, then the only valid distance that we can measure is this distance here, the curved distance along the sphere between one point and the other. This is the shortest distance between the two points whilst restricted to the surface of the sphere. Now, in this situation, it turns out that it's really useful to define a new coordinate system. Let's use our x, y, and z coordinates that we were using earlier and define a new coordinate system based on that. 
Let's momentarily put aside this picture of the sphere and the fact that we're limited to the surface of the sphere and let's just try and find a coordinate system for any point in this grid. The first coordinate that we're going to define is known as the radial coordinate, which is just straight up the distance between the origin and the point that we're trying to measure or consider. The second coordinate is known as the theta coordinate. Now this is an angle. Specifically, this is the angle that the projection of our point, the the shadow of our point, if you like, where the shadow is falling on the xy flat surface, this is the angle that that shadow makes with the x-axis. And finally, the last coordinate is the phi coordinate. This is also an angle, but this is the angle made by the radial line that we've drawn from the origin to the point and the z-axis. So we've defined a new coordinate system at this point. We had x, y, z, and now we have r theta phi. This new set of coordinates is known as spherical polar coordinates because it's really useful in defining spherical stuff. Now, let's bring back the sphere that we were stuck on. Let's use r theta phi coordinates to work out the distance between these two points. Well, if we're stuck on the surface of a sphere, which is an object that has a constant radius, then the radial coordinate of both of these points is going to be exactly the same because they're at the same radius, they're on the surface of the sphere. And therefore, the only things that we'll need to consider when measuring the distance between these two points is the theta coordinate and the phi coordinate. And of course, the two points on the sphere have different theta coordinates and phi coordinates. So we can use the differences in this theta and phi coordinates to work out the curve distance that we've been trying to work out since earlier. Now, using some clever maths, it can be shown that this is the distance that we're trying to measure. This is not the same as dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared that would be this distance here. And remember, that distance is meaningless if we're stuck on the surface of the sphere. We can't dig through the sphere. Now, being stuck on the 2D spherical surface is kind of reminiscent of what we are, except in four dimensions. We're stuck in a four-dimensional space-time. The interesting question, though, is that could an object stuck on the surface of a sphere tell that it's on a curved surface without having to look at it in three dimensions as we're seeing it? And we can apply that question to ourselves as well. Could we, without having to escape into a fifth dimension, realize whether we're in flat space-time or curved space-time? Well, mathematically, it's been shown that it can be done, and in fact, it has been done. We know that gravity results in the curvature of space-time, and we can mathematically work out how much our space-time bends as well, at least in the locality around bodies which have mass, because mass is what results in gravity, and gravity is what results in the curvature of space-time. So the point here is that we, and other massive particles, and massive objects, and light, and everything in our universe, takes the shortest path between two different points in space-time. However, everything is limited by the curvature of the space-time. So, now that we've discussed all of that, let's finally move on to the equation that Brian Greene posted on his Facebook. This equation, you'll notice, is also using the r theta phi coordinate system, and it's accounted for the extra time coordinate. It's a four-dimensional equation. But all of the stuff multiplying dt squared and dr squared is what's accounting for the curvature of space-time due to gravity. Specifically, is due to the gravity of a spherical object at the center of the coordinate system. And we can see that things are getting really weird because different coordinates are getting mixed up together and it's just a whole lot of mathematical jargon, basically. But the point is that this gives the interval between two points for the situation where there's a massive body, a body with mass, at the center of the coordinate system and this body is spherical. So the interval between two events that we're trying to measure doesn't just depend on where the events are relative to each other. It also depends on where the events are relative to the sphere at the center of the coordinate system. This kind of makes sense because the closer you are to the sphere, the larger the effect of gravity and the more the space-time around it warps. Whereas if you're further away, gravity is a lot weaker and so the warping of space-time is not so noticeable. Now, another important point is that this equation assumes that the body that we said was at the center of the coordinate system is not rotating. And as well as this, it's assumed to be not charged. These are perfectly valid assumptions to make for stars and planets and stuff like that because overall they aren't charged and even though they are rotating, their rate of rotation is actually fairly slow relative to things like neutron stars, for example, or rotating black holes. But let's come back to the fact that we said it has to be a spherical body at the center of the coordinate system. We didn't specify that it has to be a black hole. However, this equation really shines when dealing with black holes. Black holes are objects whose entire mass is squished so much that it falls within the radius known as the Schwarzschild radius. That's this distance from the origin of the coordinate system, or in other words, the center of the spherical body. So we can see that this distance, the Schwarzschild radius, is encoded into our interval measure. Measurement. This allows us to understand some really interesting things, such as, of course, how space-time warps around a spherical object with mass, but also what would happen to an object falling into a black hole. I might do a video about this in the future, so let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see it at some point. Right now, though, let me tell you about something funny. It's not like ha ha he he funny, but it's, it's kind of funny. Brian Greene posted this equation because it's most commonly used to describe black holes, because like I said, this equation really shines when dealing with black holes. 
He posted it as a response to the announcement that the Event Horizon Telescope had taken the very first picture of a black hole. But like I said earlier, one of the assumptions that we make is that the spherical object does not rotate. The particular black hole in the picture though, the black hole at the center of the M87 galaxy, is suspected to be a rotating black hole. This definitely does change things because a rotating body with mass warps space-time differently to a non-rotating body, which means Brian Greene should have posted this picture instead. This equation deals with rotating spherical objects. So it's Brian. But anyway, so I hope that this video has shed some light on what this equation means and why Brian Greene posted it, and also what the black hole equation is all about. To fully understand the intricacies and the beauty of this equation, you'd have to do uh, an undergraduate level course in general relativity or in mathematics. And to be honest, having studied GR myself during university, I know very little about it. But still, I just wanted to provide a basic intuitive understanding about what this equation and other equations like it even mean. So guys, if you enjoyed this video, then please do leave a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. This was a fairly complicated video, so if I haven't explained anything clearly enough, then let me know in the comments below and I'll try and clarify. Also, if I've got anything wrong, feel free to let me know as well. Anyway, like I said, subscribe to my channel for more fun physics videos and hit the bell button if you want to be notified every time I upload. Follow me on Instagram for one minute long physics content and on Twitter for the worst physics jokes you've ever heard. I'm going to end this video here, so thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye 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 bye.